I'm going to present the paper Extending Nearly Complete One-Planar Drawings in Polynomial Time. My name is Fabian Klute, and this is joint work with Eduard Alban from the Royal Holloway University, Robert Garnian, Teklaham, Martin Nollenburg from TU Vienna, and I'm currently at Utrecht University, but large parts of this work were done while I was still at the TU in Vienna. Now let's start to define what we have to uh, work with. First of all, drawings of graphs. Here we see four drawings of graphs and we can already see that basically drawings of graphs for us are just mappings of vertices to points and edges to simple curves. And you see that these drawings are quite different, so let's talk about some properties of graph drawings. Um, first of all, crossings are proper intersections between edges. So for example, here is a crossing or here are three crossings in this drawing. And um, this is not the only point two edges can intersect, but also at the top mo uh, at their incident vertices, which is relevant to define simple drawings. And a simple drawing is one where edges at most intersect once, so either in a crossing or at an incident vertex. And we see that the rightmost drawing is no such simple drawing, and we will not deal with these kind of drawings. Now, a one-planar drawing is one in which each edge is crossed at most once, and we see that this drawing is no such drawing, and we will also not deal with these kind of drawings. That leaves us with these two drawings on the left. And the last notion we want to introduce on this slide is a cell. And a cell is basically the analogon to a face in a planar drawing. And we see here two different cells. One cell here with a boundary similar to a face would have, just vertices and edges. And here a cell that has also a crossing on its boundary. And note that now if we would planarize this graph, of course, this crossing would turn into a vertex and we would obtain a face in a planar drawing. Okay, let's come to the graph drawing extension problems, um, the kind of problems we deal with here. Uh, in these problems, one is typically given a partial drawing of a graph. So let's say this black part is just a partial drawing of the whole graph G we want to draw in the end. And we are requested to add the parts of G that are missing to our drawing. So let's say these red parts are the parts we have to add. And now the crucial bit is that, of course, we want to keep some properties of the drawing intact. And moreover, we want to keep the subdrawing age that we were given in the beginning also intact. So we draw these red parts really on top of the drawing that we were given and are not allowed to change it. A bit more formally, as an instance, we are typically given a graph G and a subgraph H of G and a drawing calligraphy H of H with some properties. That could be planar drawing, it could be a simple drawing, and so on. And we are tasked with finding an extension, really a drawing G, calligraphy G of calligraphy H to the whole graph G that keeps the properties intact or identify there is none. And to stress again, the calligraphy H partial drawing we were given in the beginning is a sub-drawing of our solution. So we were not allowed to change it, else we would basically just draw solve recognition. So what exists there in the literature uh, in regards to extension problems? If we just look at any extending graph drawing problem, there's quite a bunch of them. Um, most notably work has been done on planar graphs. Um, if they, we consider planar graph drawings with straight lines, it was shown in 2006 by Patrignani that extending these is NP-complete. If we consider planar graphs without the straight line con uh, condition, it's solvable in linear time. Level planar and upward planar drawings turned out to be NP-complete as well in 2017 by Brückner and Rutter and in 2019 by Dalotso et al. And recently Arroyo et al. Uh, proved that extending simple drawings even with one edge is also NP-complete. So this is quite at the other end of the planarity spectrum where we are just using simple drawings and there's one edge missing in the drawing. And there are many, many more uh, results, especially if we go to a representation of graphs that are not drawings, not drawings of the type we have seen. In any case, let's see what's there for one planar drawing extension. And let's first define the specific problem we want to tackle. Here we are given a graph G and a connected subgraph H. And here we inserted this connectedness uh, property, which we require in our proofs because, well, they require it. And it is an interesting open problem if we can actually drop this connectedness assumption. And we are also given, of course, a one planar drawing calligraphy H of this connected subgraph H of G. Now we want to find a one planar extension of H to the whole graph, or again, correctly identify that there is none. Now we can rather easily show that this problem is NP hard um, by just going from one pl uh, planar recognition. 
which spawns the question what happens if g uh, if the difference between g and h is rather small and how would we quantify this well we can define some sets um, so obviously we define the set v at which is just the missing vertices between g and h e at just the missing edges between g and h and e at h which are all the edges in e at whose endpoints are both already in the subgraph h now at ICAL this year we showed that there is an FPT algorithm with respect to the cardinality of the inserted edges and here we are going to show that there's an XP algorithm with respect to the sum of the added vertices and the added edges that have both endpoints already in H. Um, just to quickly recap, an FPT algorithm is an algorithm where um, there's some, I take some function in the parameter, this can be any computable function, and I want to obtain a running time f of k times n to the c, where c is some constant. And an XP algorithm is an algorithm that runs an n to the f of k, so again f of k, any computable function, which means that for every fixed value of the parameter I obtain a polynomial time algorithm. Um, and I want to stress here that these parameters are really very different in their power, so we will see on the following slide also. Uh, and just quickly to add, in the following I will call the parameter we consider here kappa. Now, why are they different? Well, what are the challenges we have to consider when solving the problem that was defined on the slide before? Well, we have to place every vertex. So we have some vertices here in red and blue, and we have to pick a cell where they go. And this could be any cell. Well, since we are dealing with one planar drawing, you already can probably see that it's not too many cells actually, but it could still be graph size many of them. And now the really big difference between these two parameters, between restricting the number of added edges and between restricting the number of added vertices, is that one vertex that we add for uh, our problem here could already insert a linear number of edges into the graph. While if I restrict the number of added edges completely, then this is not possible. So to recap, one of these vertices can have many, 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 many edges, basically to the whole drawing, if let's say the drawing was just a cycle. And we need to decide where all these edges go for each vertex. Um, and this means deciding where they cross, how they are drawn, and note also that the drawing is not just immediately specified by the crossing, because it might make a difference how I, uh, where it, the edge exits uh, from the vertex to its crossing, and it might cut off different parts of the cell. Like here, if this edge was drawn in between here, this vertex would be cut off from this vertex. Now, what is our strategy on a very high level? On a high level, we want to branch over the locations where vertices of Vat go. So um, remember, Vat is bounded in the parameter. This is probably rather straightforward that we can do this. And now what we also want to branch over is which edge pairs in Vat cross. So this means we take two edges in the ed and look at, uh, look at the ones that of them that will cross. And that means they do not cross any parts of the drawing H. Um, then in the end, after doing this branching, we are left with only edges in the ed that cross parts of the drawing H that we are given in the beginning. And we can start to identify some structure of the drawing. We call this here in the high level overview cell parts in which they start. So from where they start, where their vertex lies on the boundary and they start and only go through these cell parts. Then we isolate pairs of vertices in VAT, all now also coming with these cell parts we identified and we restrict or we identify edge sets that can interact. And we also group these again and in the end arrive in a situation where we only have to consider two vertices and the edges inserted by them. And this uh, problem can then be solved using dynamic programming and some flow subroutine, um, which we will going to sh see first now. So let's consider this last case. So if you look in the algorithm how it goes, uh, we first do some branching, we identify a bit of structure in the drawing, and then branch over essentially the structure, and in the end resolve this all by our dynamic program, which we will now introduce. And uh, note also that this was already part of the ICAL paper in which we showed FPT for the number of edges. Um, but there the algorithm was a bit different. And also for completion, we included it completely in the write-up for MFCS and are going to present some more details here about it also in the talk than at ICAL. 
Now, what is the setup? The setup is really, we are given an instance again of one planar drawing extensions with some restrictions and most notably, um, we have all the vertices placed. So if S is our supergraph, T is our subgraph and calligraphy T the partial drawing, then we only have two marked vertices X and Y in V of S, which will be in this drawing in the bottom here, the red vertex and the blue vertex. And these are already placed, but we mark them as special. Why are they special? Well, all edges we are left to insert are actually incident to these two vertices. So here on the bottom, all these edges go to this vertex and here on the top, all these red edges go to this vertex. And we are also given two walks, an X walk and a Y walk. This is simply because this vertex is called X and this vertex is called Y. And these walks more or less follow the boundary of the incident cells of these two vertices. Now, where, we want to, uh, where do we want to arrive? We want to arrive in a situation where we can solve the whole uh, sub-instance of the sub-instance by a flow algorithm or by a flow instance. And which is the case we want to arrive to? Well, we want to cleanly split how these cells can interact. And a clean split, how would it look? Well, for example, like this. So if we consider these cells on the top and these cells on the bottom, these are only ever accessed or interesting for the red vertex and these are only always ever interesting for the blue vertex. So really these cells can be, uh, behave very independently. And you can rather easily think of a way to encode this in a flow instance and just to give you a rough idea, um, we model the cells and vertices as nodes in this instance and we encode the crossable edges as capaci capacities and the edges that we insert are then the flow that goes over the edges. And also note that, of course, a vertex here could still lie on the boundary of this red cell, but the red uh, edge cannot go through this cell anymore as it has already spent its crossing, for example, here in this rather small example. But this doesn't really solve everything because of course, as you can see here, these edges might interact very heavily and their drawings might influence how I can draw the other edge. The choice of how I draw, how I reach um, the target vertices from X and Y will influence the drawings of the edges. And this is what we have to resolve with the dynamic programming approach that then gives us um, these independent sub-instances which we can flow, uh, solve using a flow algorithm. Now, dynamic program that we use is uh, the, the limit and sweep approach. Um, remember, we are given this X and Y walk and we will rather walk them in parallel now in the dynamic program. And we, as we go, we identify the limiters that divide the instance into two parts. And then by branching over the choices of the delimiters, we arrive at eventually to sub-instances, which we can toss into the flow subroutine we just saw on the slide before and obtain a solution to them. And since they are independent, we arrive to a solution of the whole sub-instance of our big, big instance. Now, in total, there are two times five cases to handle, um, where cases are kind of the properties we identify where we can pick apart the instance. And it is really five cases, but they are, of course, symmetric with respect to X and Y. And now a record for us that we construct in this dynamic program consists of three entries, alpha X, alpha Y, and tau. Uh, tau just encodes which case we actually were in when we constructed this record. And alpha X and alpha Y are either vertices on the X or Y walk or are the drawing of a new edge. Now let's consider two of these cases. Um, so a rather straightforward and simple one is this, uh, when we basically can uh, just see an edge that uh, is incident to the cell, which is incident to this red vertex and the green edge is on the bottom incident to the cell that is incident to the blue vertex. Now by taking this vertex on the left as the record for alpha, uh, as the value for alpha x and alpha y, um, we can also uh, we identify simply a delimiter running through here and splitting the instance apart. Now, to show that this is maybe really the easiest one, here is the probably most complicated one. Um, we call this a double incursion, and crucially, the two new edges are this one coming from the top and going below, and this one coming from below and going from the top here. And these are also the values for our records alpha x and alpha y. So alpha x will be the green edge and alpha y here, the brown edge. And now crucially, we will 
ensure that there is no edge from y that goes in between these two vertices, so this red one here and this blue one here, which is also the endpoint of uh, the uh, edge we inserted from y, and this is the endpoint of the edge we crossed with the edge from coming from x. Similarly, we also ensure that there is no edge from x that goes between the endpoint of the edge we inserted from x and the endpoint of the edge that we cross with the edge coming from y. This allows us to draw a delimiter that roughly follows this path, as no edge will connect anymore to here or to here, and we can pick apart our instance. There are three more cases to handle um, just to give an idea, two of them are basically half and an incursion, and the last one is to split about, uh, apart cells, um, where we have even multiple delimiters going through, and we have to handle these as well, as we can repeatedly split a cell with a delimiter. Now, this concludes the rough overview of the dynamic program and flow approach we use to resolve this very restricted two-vertex instance, as we might call it. Now, how do we arrive there? Well, we arrive there by starting with step one. And step one applies really branching on the whole instance. So what is our setup now? Now revert, and we are given an instance g, h, and calligraphy h of one planar drawing extension, where e, g is the whole graph, h is the subgraph, and calligraphy h is the partial drawing we desire to extend in the end. And our goal in this first branching step is to arrive at an instance g h prime and calligraphy h prime, um, such that the vertices that were given to us in the et, or that are the difference of the vertices in g and in h, are all drawn, which means we have picked cells of where they go. Um, the crossing edge pairs in uh, e et minus e et h are drawn, and the edges in e et h, or the edges with both endpoints in v et are drawn. So all the edges are drawn that have just endpoints in h, and the edges that have just endpoints in Viet are drawn. As you might note, uh, notice, these are both sets of edges that are restricted in the parameter. And the crossing edge pairs are really the edges that we pick uh, of the new edges that cross between each other. So we really want to, we want to arrive to a situation where the remaining edges we have to insert do not cross each other anymore. Now, the result of this is all an n to the kappa to the three uh, uh, set of branches we have to then handle, and each comes with an instance um, that is as desired. And from now on, we can ref uh, refer to the remaining edges in the ad as the new edges. And recall that these new edges do not cross anymore in between. They can only cross uh, the drawing H uh, in what follows. Now we did our first branching step, we have n to the kappa to the three branches to consider, and now we go into more of the kind of structural analysis of the drawing. So first we do a step called uh, where we identify so-called base regions. Now for this step we can assume we are in a branch where we got one of these modified instances of one planar drawing extension, where each new edge is incident to some vertex in the ad and no two new edges will ever cross. So we are only allowed to cross parts of this H prime drawing. And now what are base regions? So assume you're given some drawing and by assumption, we now have all the vertices placed. So these might be vertices in Viet, these four green vertices that are already placed in the drawing. And we identify some set of extremal edges of them such that we know all the edges that are remaining to draw will only go between them. So an edge leaving this green vertex here can only be drawn here, here, or between here and here. And also note, well, such a region could also be just one edge. And now these regions between them we call our base regions. And now what we know is what we already hinted in the high level overview is that any edge leaving one of our green vertices here now can only start in one of the base regions. But note again that this does not mean that these behave completely independently because it could happen that a green edge like here leaves the base region and then connects to a vertex that is on the boundary of this base region if we would take its closure with the cell boundaries. Now of course this whole picture can be completed and if we just make up a bigger example like here we can spot a lot of different complications and special cases that have to be resolved and also most notably see that 
it can happen that we actually cross into the area of a base region. So consider here this dark blue vertex and uh, extremal edge that bounds the base region of it here leaves the cell and then crosses into the base region of this green vertex. And really this drawing part is now in here. Um, to resolve all these interactions, we need the step three and step four. Now, what can we do in this step? Well, what we can show is that there are only coupled to the three many base regions. And we can then branch over the drawings of these extremal edges that really bound our base regions. And this gives us again new instances where we modify now our G H prime and calligraphy H prime by inserting these extremal uh, edges and arriving to base cells. Where before a base region was kind of an abstract concept that we worked with and now base cells are really cells in this modified instance. But again, how, why are we not done? Um, you could think, well, the edges just go out of there, we resolve this all again with dynamic programming. But as already said, there are parts of drawings like here that go into the base region of other vertices. Um, there are parts of drawings where a uh, base region might go to a might go to actually cut apart a base region of another vertex and all these cases have to be handled. Now the step two being done we arrive again as n to the kappa to the three branches and now we want to go to step three. Here we identify what we call cell pairs and in each of these branches we now consider we are given again a modified instance g h double prime and calligraphy h double prime where now the assumption is that we are given also a set of base cells. So these are just cells of the drawing that we marked and they are at most coupled to the three many of them. And any new edge uv where u is the vertex in v at now starts in the base cell of u. But we don't know which of these base cells yet. Now what we want to bound is the cells accessible so to say. So a cell we can go into from another um, base cell from more than uh, from uh, more than two base cells by kappa to the three. And we want to bound vertices that we have to access and we call this marked. Uh, we will see on the next slide why uh, from also more than two base cells by kappa to the three. And after obtaining these bounds, we can identify a set of edges um, that if we insert it, we arrive to a state where we finally have um, only edges of two base cells always interacting. So how do we prove these bounds? And I will just give a very uh, rough idea again. Um, here we consider the dual for the first time and we consider the dual of the planarization of H double prime and by applying a lemma by Gajaski et al from 2017 that we can apply since planar graphs have bounded expansion um, and some observations uh, that lead to a forbidden K33 in this planar dual, we obtain the bound. Now, in the case of um, bounding the vertices, we consider another approach. We take a hypothetical solution G to our instance. So we assume we would be given by an oracle some solution and now execute an algorithm inside this hypothetical solution that goes around the uh, boundary of this cell C and marks every vertex that is not in V at by the, ver by the, other, uh, by the vertices in V at that could connect to it. So here is the marking for this example. And we see that some of them might happen to be accessible from three or be marked by three other vertices in Viet, and some by two, some by one. And we can show, again, by considering some planar graph we derive from the drawing, that there are not too many of them. They are exactly kappa to the three of them. And finally, we obtain the bound of kappa to the six on the edges uh, which we have to consider to arrive to uh, instances where only ever two base cells really interact. And by branching over these drawings of these edges, we arrive at a branching factor of n to the kappa to the nine. So why are we not done now? We are actually arrived in a, a state where only ever two base cells interact. But well, it's not like these are very independent. So if we assume these two base cells are chosen as a pair and these two are chosen as a pair, it could still be that these edges that we draw here on the left can go here or can go here. So it's not quite clear to which, to, uh, which of the two pairs these edges are actually assigned. And this will be solved in step four 
we, which we will skip in this talk. And just know it introduces a branching factor of n to the kappa to the 28. Um, so it's likely really not yet there where, uh, as low as it could be. And we assume that these branching factors could be pressed down quite a bit. To conclude, what we presented is an algorithm to solve one planar drawing extension in XP time with respect to, in other words, the edge plus vertex deletion distance from G to H. And what is there in open problems? Well, of course, what about FPT time with respect to this parameter? So take the edge plus vertex deletion distance and obtain an FPT algorithm. Then what about resolving this non-connected drawing, uh, this non-connected drawing? So we assume connected drawings and uh, we use this assumption at, uh, in several proofs along the way. What about non-connected drawings? And well, of course, you could consider other drawing extension problems through the lens of parameterized complexity and look what happens if we choose parts of the problem and restrict them. Thank you.